Hello and welcome. I am the Letter Hack, and with me now is a very special guest, advocate, activist, potential Green Party candidate of 2026 Maryland governor race. It's Andy Ellis. Andy, thank you for being here. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Uh, thank you for having me on. Is it right to say potential candidate, or can we just say candidate? We can say candidate. I okay, think, uh, yeah. I I think I've moved past that potential point, and I think I'm ready to say I'm running for governor in 2026 as a Green Party candidate. Nice. Okay. That's good. Um, I'm glad to hear that. I just want to touch on this right at the beginning, because you live in Baltimore, and my whole family's from Maryland, and I have family in Baltimore right now. So we shouldn't start the show without first talking about this tragic um, bridge collapse in Baltimore yesterday after the Francis Scott Key Bridge was struck by a cargo ship. Lives have been lost. Um, this has to affect you in multiple ways. And, and I, you know, first, I hope you didn't know anyone who was affected by it. I know these events have like a ripple effect. So you may know someone who knows somebody who was affected by it even, and that can have an impact on our lives. I was making phone calls first thing, waking people up, saying, where are you right now? In bed? Okay, I'll talk to you later, you know, and, and, and moving on with the day. But, um, uh, it's it's an unfortunate situation and and it's a serious matter. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah. So first of all, uh, you know, love and solidarity to the people who were lost and to their families. Uh, you know, there were construction workers, uh, mostly Latinx construction workers, on the bridge at the time that it was hit, doing pothole repair work in the middle of the night so that people could have a smooth drive across the bridge. Um, and we know that uh, six of them died in, in the accident. We also there are or in, in the crash. So love and solidarity to them, their families, and their communities. Um, you know, working people out there doing their job uh, when this happened. And, and so that that's the first part of it. The second part of it is uh, there's just, it's such an incredibly important economic lifeline to that part of the, of the city and that part of the area. There's 14,000 jobs, I think, at the port alone, 140,000 jobs in the area. Uh, and it is the main way uh, for people who live on the east side of Baltimore City or Baltimore County to get back and forth across the relatively large harbor. So uh, we're going to see really significant ripple effects. There's a lot of industrial plants over there uh, that are handling things that are related to the port. Uh, and so those folks are on wages. Um, and, you know, this, if there's not if there's not work, they're not going to get paid. So I, I think there's going to be a lot that we're going to see here that is going to need to happen after the harbor gets cleaned, after the rescue occurs, uh, before we even talk about there being a new bridge there. Uh, we're gonna need to do something in order to make sure that the economic impact of this does not push people into homelessness, does not push people out of jobs, does not push people, you know, there's a lot at risk right now. Uh, and so I think everybody was shocked about the sort of first day, first two days of this, and we're really focused on trying to save and recover the people who died immediately. And now our attention needs to focus to those communities that are in, oftentimes in a pretty precarious place uh, and figure out how the, their jobs are going to get done, um, how they're going to pay their bills. And I think we also have to look and make sure that ship doesn't start to leak its fuel. It was on the way to Sri Lanka, I think. So it was full of diesel fuel. It was full of other things. And it is sitting in the harbor right now. And it, it's sitting on the, it's grounded in places. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot that can still happen um, beyond the people who died immediately. Uh, and we need to really be careful about that because those communities around the east side of Baltimore um, are built around the working side of the harbor. Um, you know, if people have been to Baltimore, they know the inner harbor, they know the uh, the sort of, um, you know, public mall that has been around the inner harbor and all the development that is around the inner harbor, but the outer part of the harbor is working. It's industry. Uh, and those industrial working class communities around the harbor 
are hit real hard right now. So we're going to have to watch and, and, and make sure that those folks are taken care of as well as the as the construction and the engineering work. It's, you know, okay, so your governor, crisis occurs. No one saw this coming. It could have been predicted. It could have been avoided. But when it happens, there's a blizzard of activity where you have to all at once be a human and yep. be a governor who takes all this. You just laid out a bunch of stuff I didn't think about. You have to take all this stuff into account. You have to look out for literally everyone involved. You have to be sympathetic, but analytic. You have to be critical, but with solutions, right? You need to be able to address this in terms of policies that would help prevent it next time and and criticize people who may have not voted on those policies previously for preventing this disaster. There's all this stuff. It sounds like you're capable of handling that, but do you think about those situations in terms of your own bandwidth for being able to, you know, lead through a crisis? Look, I mean, I don't think, I think, I don't think anybody's prepared for something like this to happen. It, that's the yeah. sort of nature of it. But uh, I, you know, I, I hope that I would be able to, I hope that I would be able to lead in a crisis like this. Uh, and, um, you know, I, my mom is a, used to work at FEMA as an emergency management person. My dad used to be in crisis communications. Uh, so I, I might be able to reach to the family and some of their experience for those type of things. But I also know that there are a ton of people in this state who are really competent and really capable of doing the work that is necessary. And, you know, it's like the federal government is right there, D.C. and Annapolis, uh, where the Naval... Anna the Naval Academy is in Annapolis and then DC is right down the road from us. So it's like, uh, you know, on day two, I think our current governor is handling it relatively well. There's sort of a set of things that you need to do when these type of things happen, mobilize resources, connect with the people who uh, have a stake in it, make sure you're taking care of communities, make sure you're taking care of policy and all that stuff. And, and in some sort of ways, I think the first couple of days of something like this, probably run on a playbook that doesn't take a ton of decision making, you know, uh, but it's, it's once we start to figure out what, uh, how we, how we make those communities that are affected by it, um, be able to be sustained, how we deal with the economic problem, how we deal with the environmental problem, where who is in that office starts to matter, who got them in that office starts to matter. Um, because those long-term decisions that got us here and that will get us beyond here are where, um, you know, a lot of the bad stuff, I think, happens in the, in the two-party system right now. Uh, when the people who are getting our current Governor Westmore elected are wealthy corporate interests combined with sort of establishment Democratic Party folks, they're going to push in a certain way on how the bridge gets rebuilt. On, on whether we go after the shipping company, you know, and, and, and I don't know, those decisions are, are the ones that I think are more important than in the moment of crisis. As long as the state has the infrastructure set up and the governor is not Trump or, or incompetent, um, you know, there's inertia around managing a crisis like this that gets you through the first couple of days, you know? Yeah. Okay. So, like I was saying, I was born and raised in um, Annapolis. My whole family hails from Baltimore. I have family there now. And so when I heard about your efforts to run for governor, I knew I had to get you on the show. But I'm also very eager to talk to someone about third party electoral politics, especially from an actual candidate and somebody in the Green Party. But first, yeah. while I get in on tonight's drawing, as I always do, I was hoping you could give us a bit of your origin story. Um, when did you decide to get into politics and what led to joining the Green Party? Did you, did your um, ambitions grow out of a history of activism or or maybe there was a single catalyst in your past that led to your decision? Yeah, so I, I would say uh, I started, I, I grew up in the D.C. area, um, um, you know, Northern Virginia for a while and then um, Frederick, Maryland for a while. Uh, and the activity that I did when I was in high school was debate. I was on the debate team. I did policy debate and I did that in high school and I did that in college and debate introduced me to a set of 
I think uh, what I was sure at the time were radical theory and radical policy solutions. Um, you know, that, um, uh, yeah, to a set of radical theory and radical policy solutions. So when I left debate, uh, when I stopped competing, I, I traveled the country for 10, about 10 years being a coach. I went to Vermont, I went to Long Beach, I went to Wyoming, I went to upstate New York. Um, and then I came back to Maryland to run a nonprofit, uh, a middle school division of a nonprofit that, that taught Baltimore City students how to do this kind of debate. So from there, I, um, you know, very quickly developed the distrust, distaste for the two party system for the existing, uh, for the for, for politics as it was practiced right now. And I think I voted green here and there and I supported green efforts, but it wasn't really until 2015 uh, after the Baltimore uprising that I looked around and realized that there was a moment where had there been a green party in place and empower in Baltimore city that could have met that moment, we could have changed the trajectory of the city in a pretty significant way. Um, and there wasn't. And I thought that it was worth my time and effort um, to join the existing Green Party and to help it build the capacity um, and the capacity of the strategy and the vision to be able to push back, to be able to be able to offer a different pathway uh, th than the Democrat majority had offered uh, so far. So I got involved in the City Green Party in 2015. I was around for the first Stein or for the I guess second Stein campaign. Um, I was involved in the state party for a while. I ran for state delegate in 2018. Um, and I've been doing this, you know, um, pretty consistently since 2015. And, uh, you know, my, my thought at the end of the day is that the United States, Maryland, Baltimore needs a multi-party system, it needs a system where multiple parties uh, can exist, can be healthy and can thrive. Uh, and the Green Party, uh, with values rooted in justice, democracy, um, peace, and, e and ecology, needs to be one of those healthy parties in a multi-party system. So we always hear, I mean, on this show, that the Democrats don't want real change, that they are just playing along in a duopoly for fundraising purposes and, and for special interest cash and their donors. If you agree with that, and I think you do, um, why do you think it is that people continue to vote for them? Are, are, are people under the impression that they're just stuck in this cycle where we need to vote for the lesser of two evils? And, and how, how does a third party come into play in terms of changing that mindset? Because you, it could be enough to say a third party would do that, but how does it convince voters of that? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Uh, and I think it's a question that is oftentimes skipped over by third party practitioners. I think that there's a lot of third party practitioners who have gotten so accustomed to fighting against money in politics, a rigged media climate uh, and voter apathy um, that they assume that there isn't power that can be built in those spaces. And they sort of revert to an escapist politics. So I think that there's some greens that haven't effectively answered the question that you that you've just asked. And I think they um, they don't have a theory behind the action um, that, that sort of convinces voters over time to make the change. So for me, uh, what I believe is that is that when third parties succeed is when and this comes this theory of mine comes from work by a guy named Dr. Bernard Tomas. Uh, who wrote a book called like the rise and demise of American third parties. Uh, and he studies what, what caused them to be successful, what caused them to fail over the last hundred years or so. And what he says is there are three conditions in which uh, third parties succeed. One is uh, in cases in which both dominant parties are wrong on an issue of moral importance. Uh, so if you think about Gaza uh, and Israel right now, uh, the Republicans have one position, the Democrats have one position. They're not the same exactly, but they're both wrong. They're both on the side of genocide. Uh, and so when third parties can identify a position like that, where they offer a policy solution that is different 
from what the two major parties offer, um, that can galvanize voters. So those are the two. Um, two parties are wrong on it. Third party offers a better position. And the third is the ability to mobilize resources and votes around that question. So I think if you look at what's happening with Jill Stein right now, I think part of the reason that Jill Stein's campaign is more successful this year uh, than people might have thought it would be or is getting more attention is because the genocide in Gaza has polarized a lot of people and she is the right candidate at the right time um, to be able to you know, be the sort of lightning rod for that. So I think part of that is being strategic and pivoting and being willing on third parties to uh, identify opportunities like this to be able to make distinctions and to move off of the stuff that may have been co-opted. You know, it's like, I think there's a lot of discussion. Greens will often say the Democrats took the Green New Deal from us. Okay. Um, that may or may not be true, but what are we going to do about that? Right? Like we can't fight them for the, we can't, we're not going to effectively be able to get enough media or money behind an argument that says they took it from us, it was really about us. We need to pivot off of that and start making different environmental arguments. We need to start saying when they do the Green New Deal, it's flawed in this way or that way. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, there has to be strategy to this. It can't just be um, an appeal to moral righteousness. There has to be strategy uh, if Greens are being going to be able to build the power in order to put pressure and change outcomes. So how many counties would the governor or does the governor oversee? 24, is that right? 23, and then this Baltimore city is treated as a county sometimes. And oh, sometimes it, it's 24 is the is what the state would say. Um, Baltimore city is in a weird position where the state uh, writes, you know, like for up until very recently, the state was in charge of our police force, for example. So it's like 23 plus Baltimore city. So you don't have to watch much TV and film to realize that Baltimore in particular has a notoriously corrupt political system and police force and, and, you know, crime is high. People have fictionalized it. People have written about it in, in nonfiction manner as well. What sort of challenges does that mean for the governor? Does that, does a high level of corruption and you know you have to take it with a grain of salt when you're watching like an HBO program or something but but you know some of these stories are are true um does that distract you from the things that matter when you're in office or do you have to you know walk and chew gum at the same time i mean people given cam given campaign finance laws as they are People are going to try to use money uh, and offers of money in order to get people to do things. And, and it, I think one of the things that happens in Baltimore, Baltimore is a working class black majority city where there is not a lot of generational wealth. There is not a lot of people who are self-funding campaigns and things like that. Uh, but there are very, very powerful institutions like the philanthropy organizations, some of the corporations, the universities like Johns Hopkins that have uh, just so much more money than anybody can comprehend. So part of the reason that there's corruption here is because those organizations with infinite amounts of money are looking at working class politicians who actually have real world problems, like they need to refinance their mortgage or something like that. Um, and, you know, and, and when you're when you're when your electeds come from the working class and don't have generational wealth behind them, they run into real people problems. They have to refinance their mortgage. They get sick. They have things like that. And if you look at a decent amount of the corruption that has occurred here, it has occurred because somebody with infinite money has seen a vulnerable, an economically vulnerable politician that they can go after. Now, I'm not saying that's all of it, right? But it, but but if we want to understand corruption in this city, we've got to understand who the electeds are and who has the real money. Um, because that that we presents a big problem for it. Second thing I would say about it is, yeah, of course, uh, this state is a state of inequity and imbalance. There are corporations that, um, you know, have tax breaks, have really huge tax breaks in order to do development, in order to do things that aren't in the best interest of the people, but are in the best interest of the politicians. So that creates a real problem. Um, 
because of inequity and lax campaign finance laws, um, corruption is going to be a problem. And we, were, we would need to, you know, one of the things that I'd like to see the state do is take that on, um, not necessarily by prosecuting corrupt politicians, especially, you know, it, it, in Baltimore, that often looks like prosecuting working class black people um, for taking amounts of money that are minimal compared to what wealthy white people are moving in, in other places. So you got to fight corruption by fighting inequity and changing the campaign finance laws so that there's not so much of it that can, you know, it's not so easy um, to write a check that somebody needs. Has there been a third party candidate in the governor's race before in Maryland? Yeah. So Greens, Greens, Libertarians and the Reform Party have run candidates at different points in the past. Uh, and, you know, Maryland is one of the states where ballot access uh, for the party is dependent on um, either is dependent on how you do in the presidential race or the gubernatorial race. So most of the time when parties are running uh, gubernatorial candidates, it is to get 1% so that they can get um, two more years of ballot access. Um, Greens have not gotten to that 1% threshold before, and it means that we're constantly petitioning. Libertarians have gotten there twice, um, and they're there right now, and they, they hope to stay there. Um, I think last time there was also a working class party candidate in the race, um, you know, but our last governor's race, um, the, the Republican or the Democrat Westmore beat the mega Republican Dan Cox by like 35 points or something. So um, it wasn't the least bit close. You know, it's it, that's the nature of Maryland, though. Do the two big parties um, try to restrict access to the ballot? Do they have tactics they try to employ to keep, you know, people from from third parties getting in the race or? We have not really encountered that so much here in Maryland, um, and, and in part because there's no close races in Maryland. Yeah. Um, the presidential race is not close. The gubernatorial race is usually not close. And, and almost all of the state legislative districts are either deep red or deep blue. Um, and so they don't really care. I mean, they, they have, they've done, they've done some lawsuits, but it's not some of the things that you hear in other places where they're doing really dirty tricks in order to knock people off the ballot. Now, that doesn't mean they won't, um, but for the most part, um, there's not enough close races that they care right now. Would your campaign focus more on issues or the opposition and other candidates? Yeah. So I think... Um, one of the reasons that I'm running is because I want to make very clear what a green political program looks like and how it compares to the political program of the Democrats and the Republicans. So I'm going to focus on issues uh, first and foremost. I want to I want to lay out distinct policy solutions to problems that are affecting Marylanders that are um, based in green values, based in justice, based in peace, based in democracy, and based in ecology. Now that being said. I will talk about the performance of my opponents uh, and I will talk about you know, their motivations and things like that. Uh, but one thing that I think that I'm going to do that I wish more Greens uh, did was have as much criticism for the Republicans running for governor as I do for the Democrats running for governor. That's right? a good point. Like, I think... Um, I have my problems with the Democrats, uh, and I think that both parties have their flaws, but I think that there is oftentimes, it just feels to me like Greens are directing their fire at Democrats. Um, and it is like, in many cases, it's like, we are the people that the Democrats or that the Republicans think the Democrats are. You know, um, I, I often think about it like in 2016, if Jill Stein had been on the stage while Donald Trump was calling Hillary Clinton a communist, both Hillary Clinton could have been, she's the communist. I'm, I'm a neoliberal capitalist, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, that, that actually means that we are, you know, Greens believe in critical race theory, I would say, for example, whereas Republicans want to have a debate about CRT um, Democrats often will say, oh, we're, we're not saying that, we're not doing that. They, they try to sidestep it. And Greens need to go right at Republicans uh, on the things that they are doing wrong and right at Democrats on the things that they're doing wrong. 
You know, I always think to myself, it would be so cool if a bunch of Democrats defected to the Green Party. If they all said, hey, guess what? We're done with this. We're going to the Green Party. And that makes me wonder, do you ever try and actively recruit politicians to come over? Is that a Green Party thing? Yeah. Yeah. And so I think there's a really interesting push and pull on this, because if we go and we recruit somebody who is a current and active Democrat, and they bring a strong base with them um, that is, say, rooted in the DSA, for example, or something like that. Um, the party has to be in a strong enough position to be able to help them in that fight, right? And, and so, like, say we got a, we ran a city council race a couple of years ago. A, a, a teacher and union leader named Franca Mueller Paz ran as a Green, and she got thirty-five percent of the vote which is uh, the most that anybody in a city council race outside of a Democrat has gotten since like the 1960s. Um, And we often talked about what what it would look like if she won, if she was the one green on a 13 Democrat council with the Democrat mayor and a Democrat um, and a dinner, you know, everybody else elected as Democrats. And if there's not a party in place that can back her up as she goes and tries to have those fights, uh, those political fights and those political realignments, then it's going to be very hard for her or for somebody like that. So I think that it's really useful to find disaffected Democrats. But I think before we get there, uh, the party has to build the capacity to support them, uh, both at election time and then if they're in power, um, to be able to put pressure to make it so that that person just doesn't get isolated and ignored. What's uh, We have... I guess we've sort of talked about this, but but let me ask you this anyway. So you're running to serve all of Maryland, right? Yep. Whether they voted for you or not. And that's something that I wish candidates would talk about more often at all levels of government. Um, citizens made up of the left and the right. Yep. How, how do you cut through those opposing ideologies and various political uh, political typologies um, is that is that a benefit to to having a third party option where you can go? You guys are left and right. We're green. Does that mean something? Yeah, yeah, totally. So I think a really good example of this is um is with is about taxes. So okay. Maryland, but the Maryland budget is way out of whack right now. Uh, it is uh, billions of dollars in the in the deficit going forward over the next couple of years. Uh, so the our suggestion is that we raise taxes on the wealthy, um, and that means raise, um, you know, progressive taxation, uh, an income tax, uh, incre- increase capital gains tax, increase wealth tax, close the corporate tax loopholes, uh, and get the meds and eds, the hospitals and the big and the big universities to pay their fair share. The Democrat solution is user fees and sales tax increases. And the Republicans right now are really mad at the Democrats about user fees and sales tax increases because most of the user fees are on, they're like on hunting licenses and fishing licenses and and a bunch of stuff that Republicans do, or at least that's how the Republicans see it, gun purchases and things like that. And so I think that that, you know, the Republicans may not agree with us uh, um, that we need to have progressive taxation on wealthy people and on corporations. But we do have a point of agreement that the solution here is not user fees, uh, is not user fees and is not, um, you know, sales tax. And and so I think that there's places like that where we disagree with the Democrat supermajority um, in a way that we can we can rethink politics a little bit. We, we, it may be a little bit harder to get them to agree that the corporation should have to pay more taxes or the people should have to pay more taxes, but we can at least unite around like we're tired of user fees and sales taxes. And so I think that, I think that there's some places like that where being outside of the two party system gives you the ability to say, um, to create different coalitions. Um, I think one of the values of multi-party democracy is that it creates multi-dimensional coalitions. Um, So if you have, if you only have two parties, um, there's not really, other than conservative Democrats uh, working with Republicans, there's not really another swing space. But if you have three parties, you can have a swing to the left of the Democrats or 
um, you know, it, so I don't know. I think I think it creates opportunities to have those conversations. So, you know, like I say, I grew up in Frederick uh, and Frederick until very recently was a pretty conservative red county. I went to high school with folks that I'm sure are Trump voters right now. Um, and, you know, it's um, I think there's a little bit difference in being able to talk to those folks when you don't have a D next to your name um, than when you do. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to go and have conversations with people who hate me or want to see my neighbors, you know, what I don't, I'm not going to go out there and have open conversations with the folks who think Baltimore is a shithole or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, but I mean, I'll talk to them, but I'm not, I'm not ceding ground to them, but I think there's places to seek um, agreement outside of the sort of, two party structure. And that's what, and I think if we had, it, it's not just that I want there to be a third party. I want there to be a multi-party system um, because it creates more opportunity for political coalition and it gives voters more ability to align with something different in each election. Are there going to be debates? Yeah. Great. I can't wait. Cause I mean, you're, you were a debate coach. You were in debate and this would be the greatest opportunity for you to be able to lay this kind of stuff out for the voters directly. What the election is uh, in 2026. When would debates occur? So uh, last time around, Maryland Public Television and a few other organizations uh, hosted debates and they had criteria for when uh, which candidates would be on the ballot. The Green Party and the Libertarian Party did not meet the criteria the last time around. I think it's like you have to be doing X and Y poll or something like that, or you have to raise X amount of money. Yeah. So our goal is to understand what those criteria are as soon as we can get the debates, the debate sponsors to say, and then organize toward that. You know, so it's much easier to say we need to... Um, we need to have raised a hundred thousand dollars by September of 2026 so that we can be on the debate stage than it is to try to scramble in September of 20 in August of 2026, um, you know, or to pressure or something like that. So debates are going to be typically in September and October of 2026. And in the past there's been two or three or maybe four. Um, our goal is to certainly be in all of them. And our goal is to make sure that uh, part of the reason that we're starting early is so that there's enough name recognition, but also enough resources and, again, enough pressure to make sure that those debate sponsors are letting us on the stage. Um, and I think that that alone, um, look, I'd like to win. I'd love to be the next governor of Maryland. But like, if we can get on the debate stage and we can talk about progressive taxation on the stage, if we can talk about public ownership, if we can talk about... Um, justice, democracy, peace, and ecology on the debate stage, I think it really gives people an opportunity to see they have choices outside of the two-party system. Move the needle. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned Maryland Public Television. You, you might not be old enough for this. Were you a fan of Captain Chesapeake growing up? Do you ever yes, watch? yes. Okay. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just I, want I, to prove I'm from Maryland. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, we and I think with the Voyage of the Mimi or something was a show <laughs> something, that we, yeah. we watched a lot of. So that's um, great. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Uh, so, okay, you've been involved in grassroots campaigns. This is essentially is not your first campaign, right? Um, are you, in a sense, hitting the ground running based on previous experience? So I have a pretty good... Um, between debate and activism and other work, I started with a pretty good network, but we knew uh, that if we wanted to re really build a viable third party campaign, uh, especially without access to big money, um, that we needed to start early. So that's why we started in 2022. We announced the day after election day and we put together a four year plan that allows us to get into 2026 with energy, momentum, power and name recognition. Uh, and, you know, so. I, I, I don't think, I think if I had wanted to run for city council or if I'd wanted to run for state delegate, my local networks would have allowed me to hit the ground running. Uh, I don't think for a statewide race like governor, 
uh, I was in a place to be able to do that. Uh, and so that's why, you know, last year uh, was really a lot of planning, a lot of ideas. This year, we're starting to put that plan into place. Next year, we want to declare uh, and start working toward campaign financing. And then in 2026, we want to run full out and get as many votes as we can through election day. Okay, I was telling you off air before the show that you have a highly organized website, and I want to show that for um, our viewers. It's it'll be it is in the description of this video. It's also uh, pinned in the chat right now, so you can always take a look at that. I want to take a look at it right now while I ask you this question. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I have to share my screen. Okay, so. Um, with so much effort in planning on the front end, is it safe to assume that no matter the outcome of the governor's race, you'll be leaving a Green Party mechanism in place for future campaigns, no matter the level, right? So it could be something that assists the presidential race. It could be something that assists the next governor candidate or whatever. Is Can you talk about that a little? Yeah. So that is certainly one of the goals. Uh, the, the goal is never to run through run to election day and stop. The goal is to use the campaign as a means of building the party um, so that the party can, like I said, be one of those forces that uh, exists in Maryland, um, you know, and, and make Maryland into a multi-party state in which the Green Party is one of them. So I think that means some things like developing the capacity of volunteers to be able to do petition collection, to be able to do canvassing, uh, to be able to do those. It also means developing a green political program that takes the party platform and values and translates it to what it looks like in Maryland. Uh, and it, it also involves getting new people involved and getting new volunteers, new donors, and things like that. And I think one of the goals is to be able to make a, um, to help the party to take a step up and, and where its baseline is. Um, like I say, I'd love to I'd love to be the next governor, uh, but I'm a st I'm a student of history and political science, and I know that the odds are against me. Uh, nonetheless, at the end of this campaign, I want the Green Party to be stronger. I want more people to know about it, and I want to have a set of policies that meet the needs of Marylanders and meet the needs of people all around the state who don't feel included right now, who don't feel like they're benefiting from, you know, uh, the, the two parties and have specific policy solutions that people can implement at the state level and at the local level. Well, it's a highly organized website. It's very easy to read. It's, it's, um, like I was saying, I, I've been to a lot of these sites lately where it's just like, here's the bullet points of what I'm running on and here's how you can donate. And that's good. That's fine. But assuming they're out there talking in detail about this stuff, but you go into detail with it and you're showing an actual um, legit plan, which feels viable to me. Um, Thank you. What and, and I mean, I have to applaud that as a graphic designer, but also as somebody who's been looking at this stuff for, for several years and, and just recently talking to people about it a lot. And so I, I encourage everyone to check that out, but at mainly to see what the campaign the campaign is about, but as a side note, because this is what we do here, we sort of analyze this thing to see what a decent website should look like, what a campaign website should look like, what a candidate should be talking about on their site. Besides, here's six bullet points I'm running on. I copied and pasted it from somewhere else, and the donation part, and and you have it all there. And I think that people should really just look at it with a critical eye to see, um, you know, how it works so well. And, and like, and, and, you know, this is darn it. We deserve this kind of thing. When you go to a candidate's website, you deserve to get the full story and then some, and it shouldn't be, you know, illegible for, for the overwhelming content and yours yeah. isn't, it's just perfect. So, yeah. And, you know, so we, thank you. I really appreciate that. And, um, the logo there was designed by a local designer who runs a, um, who runs a company called Zerflin. Uh, and, um, his name is Ben Jankowitz. He's done really good work on it. And, I, and, you know, it's, I appreciate getting a designer 
to do the logo as opposed, you know, we had a Canva logo for a while and whatever, it's fine, it sufficed. But once we had the resources, we wanted to get a designer. Uh, and I really like what he did with the logo where he makes sure that he includes the water uh, and, and a version of Maryland and it doesn't just show up as empty space because, uh, you know, we have a Chesapeake Bay here, we have a lot of lakes, we have a lot of rivers and it's a huge part of the state of Maryland. So um, I'm really excited for that. Shout out to Zerflin for that. And uh, I think, um, they did great work on it. The second thing I will say is our philosophy about the website is it should be three things. It should be those bullet points that you talk about so that somebody who's just looking to get quick information can get the brochure version. Yeah. Then it should uh, be a political education tool so that people can learn more about the issues, the theories, the values that are and the ideas that are propelling us. Uh, and then it should encourage people to take action. Uh, and so uh, that's sort of my thought that goes into this is on each page, it should give you basic information. It should give you an access to be able to get more information and to have political education uh, that helps you understand something. And it should encourage action. We talked about how a third party candidate could get people from either side, uh, yep. left and right to vote. And and that's, I guess... I asked a question, although I may not have specified, I asked that in terms of like existing voters. Do you think a third party candidate can get all new voters to the polls? Because if if you watch mainstream media, they say, well, you got to win over those Trump supporters if you're a Democrat running for office and, and vice versa, I guess. But what I want to know is how do you get the people who don't vote or vote infrequently to go to the polls for sure? Will a third party candidate help with that? Yeah, certainly. So uh, certainly in instances in which there are more parties representing more positions of the electorate, more people will be engaged. Um, you know, it just, it, if a third party candidate is is at all successful, they will galvanize people who are um, who are opting out of the other two parties. Uh, and, and typically what will happen in Maryland is um, one of the third party candidates for governor will grab the attention of the independents, the unaffiliated, the third party folks, or the infrequent voters, and they'll get a little, and they'll become the sort of candidate for that cycle. Last time around, that was the libertarian. And so uh, as the third party candidate that had the most attention last time, the libertarian was able to steer the conversation in libertarian directions. Uh, and so I looked at that and I decided that I want to be that candidate next time. Uh, and I want to be able to steer the conversation toward progressive taxation, toward investments in, in communities, toward a more robust democracy. Should voting be mandatory? No, I don't think so. I don't think I, I, I think that there's interesting. I worry about anything that is mandatory. Um and how it's going to get enforced in this country. And I think that anything that puts laws and requirements on people um, that has a punishment uh, is disproportionate on, on Black people, disproportionate on Latino people, disproportionate on young people, and disproportionate on working people. So while I think there's interesting theoretical debates to have about mandatory voting, I think that given how the U.S. enforces laws and rules, um, I would be really worried about how that would be used um, to serve the interests of white supremacy and capitalism. Yeah, I mean, I guess they do it in Australia where you get like a small fine for not voting. And I think people in the U.S. would be like, I'm cool with that fine. Yeah. <laughs> no, what's 20 bucks? Whatever. Um, yeah, but I, I guess I would just worry what else, it, what, what the other implications would be. Like if they would say, if you don't vote in this election, you can't vote yeah. in the next one. Or, you know, like I just, I don't trust most of our lawmakers uh, to enforce sanctions on people for most anything, uh, because I've seen that most of the time when they do, it's disproportionately impacting black people, young people, Latino people, working people, et cetera. What's one issue, whether nationally or in Maryland, your call, what's one issue that, that of all the horrible things you think people might not be focused on as much as they ought to be? Can you pick one? Yeah, I'll pick one. Um, I, and so tomorrow is opening day of, uh -huh. uh, for the Orioles, and um, I have been writing uh, all of the end of last year calling for public ownership uh, of major league baseball teams. And the cool. reason that I'm calling for public ownership of major league baseball teams is because 
the owners are extracting um, huge, huge amounts of money out of cities and states. The state of Maryland gives $600 million um, to the six hundred million dollars to the Orioles to sign a new lease, uh, and those are bi- those are billionaires that are getting tax subsidies to run a private family-run business. Uh, and if we don't get out of this, uh, we're going to continue to be in a place where um, you know they're just extortion scams. Uh, where we're billionaire owners threaten to take teams away from cities uh, and cities and states taxpayers pony up billions of dollars to keep them there uh, borrow and, and borrow and, and give them to the to these owners so uh, Baltimore City Charter uh, has a part in it after the Colts left in 1984 that allows the city to use eminent domain to take a sports team um, and I actually think that this is an area that we should explore uh, because I think uh, not just do I love the Orioles, but I don't love that my state gave them $600 million um, in order to keep them here uh, with the threat of them leaving. So I think we need politicians who are willing to challenge Major League Baseball's antitrust exemption. And then I think we also need politicians who are willing to have real and honest conversations about what public ownership looks like um, in order to stop you know, this this sort of cabal of billionaires who have an anti who have a congressional protection trying to extort city and state taxpayers of hundreds of millions and billions of dollars. So yeah, that's my that's my one pet issue uh, that that is um, not as serious as the other one, and yet it is because it speaks about how we deal with a world in which big corporations and very wealthy people are the beneficiaries of taxpayer dollars uh and taxpayers have no democratic control over it um you just won over the entire chat so i don't know how unserious that actually yeah i think it's pretty serious i mean 600 million is nothing to sneeze at and yeah and that should go to the right um you know it shouldn't go to the people it's going to i'll put it that way if if you had the opportunity let's say you're governor for a number of years if you had the opportunity to run for president would you oh no I don't want to do that. Um, I, I, I don't, I am not, I am not right now a huge fan of green and third party presidentialism. I understand why they have to do it. I understand that it makes sense, but I think as a strategic move over the course of the last 24 years, um, it has put us in a worse place. Uh, and I understand the necessity of it. And I, I'm excited to be supporting the Stein campaign this year. I'm excited to have supported the Hawkins campaign in the past. But if I had my say, I would not. I would have a Green Party that revisited that decision that they made 20 years ago that they're going to run a president in every cycle. And I don't have any interest in doing it myself. Um, I think that the race for the U.S. presidency represents all that is wrong with politics in a sense. It is highly polarized, uh, you know, electoral college, uh, and it is nationalized. I think that I think that nationalized elections are bad in general. I think they drive the polarization. I think they drive the money. Uh, and I understand why Greens compete in them. And I wish we wouldn't. And I don't have any interest in never being that person. Would you rather see the funding that goes toward Green Party presidential races go toward all other level of governments promoting those Green Party candidates? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think for me and my and my vision of it, and it's convenient because I'm running for governor. Uh, but I think governor is the for me uh, is that is a great race to run because it's abstract enough that you can talk about uh, big issues, uh, but it's also practical enough uh, that you can connect to people uh, on the ground on it. You know, So it's like, we can talk about wealth inequality. We can talk about infrastructure investment. Um, we can talk about subsidies for billionaires uh, running for governor in a way that we really can't running for city council or state delegate. Uh, but at the same time, I can get around the 24 counties in Maryland um, you know, in my in my little car, um, without having to fly all over the place. Uh, you know, I don't know. I just I think nationalized nationalized campaigns are one of the reasons that polarization has gotten so bad. And I think it's time for third parties to think about whether or not that's a good strategy for them. Well, 
sound like the real deal to me. That's what the chat is saying. Um, you're a genuine guy. You're very honest. That was a very honest answer about the presidency um, and, and the campaign for presidency. Uh, you're also a very smart guy, intelligent guy. So I kind of had that in mind when I was picking out what comic book I was going to recommend to you because I never end the show without recommending a comic to my guest. Have you ever read comic books, first of all? I am not really a comic book reader, um, but I'm very excited about this part because I'm willing to have this recommendation, go read it. And then like, if we come back on, if I come back on to talk to you about it. Great. Okay. And you are definitely coming back on. So we may have that opportunity. Um, I like to recommend comic books to people who don't currently read them as a means of showing that they're not all Marvel and DC, right? Mm -hmm. They can be about anything. This one's called Smot Guy, spelled S-M-A-H-T Guy, one word, okay. Smot Guy, The Life and Times of Barney Frank. Okay. Remember politician Barney Frank? Absolutely. Um, congressman. It's by Eric Orner. Eric Orner, the acclaimed cartoonist of one of the country's most popular and longest running gay comic strips, the, most, uh, the mostly unfabulous social life of Ethan Green, presents his debut graphic novel, A Dazzling irreverent biography of the iconic and iconoclast Barney Frank, one of the first gay and out, uh, out and outspoken congressmen and on frontline uh, front defender of civil rights. Now look, I know who Barney Frank is. I didn't know if I was going to buy a comic book about him, but it was recommended to me by someone who, um, actually her name is Mari Naomi. She created these databases for comic book creators of color, comic book, uh, disabled comic book creators and queer comic book creators. And she has her finger on the pulse of what's a good read. Okay. So I checked it out and it's a wonderful comic. You may not agree with everything Barney Frank did while in office. Okay. But as a comic book, it's fantastic. I highly recommend it. So check that out. If you do, like we were saying, come back on and let me know what you thought. I, I absolutely will. And, you know, I think, um, if, if Green's only read things that Green's wrote uh, or Green's only read things that socialists wrote, um, we would have a really hard time, and we do have a really hard time communicating with people who don't just read that stuff. So um, my mom used to work for Senator Hollings from South Carolina, uh, and so I know very well who Barney Frank is, and she talked about him a lot. Um, you know, I, we were a household that watched the news a lot. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm excited to read this. Uh, and when I come back on, we can talk about that or we Great. can talk about whatever else. Well, we didn't even touch on the fact that you have your own show. I do. Your own podcast even. So, um, do you want to go ahead and just, like I said, we got descriptions in or, or, uh, links in the description for all of your stuff. Do you want to go ahead and plug anything or talk about anything before we wrap? Yeah, yeah, sure. So my podcast is uh, the Go Green 2026 podcast. And basically, it's an opportunity for me to have folks um, who are experts uh, in something that I'm interested in come on and talk about that thing. Uh, and so it is folks whose ideas and um, ideas and work are inspiring and influencing the campaign. Uh, and I don't know that this was the intention of it, but what it has really sort of become is a... Um, is a deep dive um, on somebody giving me advice in some ways. You know, they're, they're not explicitly saying like, this is what you should do, but I'm asking questions from the perspective of a candidate who wants to learn more about this. Uh, and they're going deep on, on the thing that they've worked on for a very long time. And I love it. I love talking to people about what they love to talk about. Uh, and I love learning from it. And so um, it's, it's, we, we don't do it live right now. Uh, we're doing it as a recorded show, but it's um, Go Green 2026. I think you have the link in there. Um, last week, we did an episode about uh, the labor organizing at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, so the grad students at Johns Hopkins University are organizing. They're on the verge of going, uh, going to strike. And so we took one of their organizers and we sat down for an hour and we went through uh, the history of the labor movement in higher ed. We went through why they were striking and how folks can get involved. We've done previous topics on Cop City with Renee, who I know you had on. Um, we've talked about reparations and um, progressive taxation. We've just had some great, really in-depth conversations. And we also, I also did a conversation with um, 
Dr. Bernard Tomas, who I mentioned earlier, who goes really deep into the theory and, and history and practice of third parties. Coming up soon, we have Devarian Baldwin, who was the uh, author of um, In the Shadow of the Ivory Tower. And he talks about the way that these big private universities and urban areas have become the new company town and how we need to have sort of progressive taxation to rein them in and direct them back toward um, serving the people and serving the communities. And we have Jack Santucci coming up, uh, who is a guy who wrote a book all about multi-party democracy and the history of that. So each of these is an hour long deep dive uh, just into the work that these folks have done. Um, and it's a great way for me to, as a candidate, um, to just learn really deep and detailed issue bases that um, then become part of the platform, become part of what we talk about. So that's that. And um, then you can follow me uh, on X, Twitter, whatever, um, at Be More Connected. I have a campaign account set up yet, but I don't really have, um, I put stuff out on it occasionally. Uh, but the place where I really interact and talk and share is, uh, is the Be More Connected one. Uh, and then the campaign website is gogreen2026.com. Uh, and check it out. We're in the process of doing some upgrades and revisions on it, but um, it's going to keep most of the most of the things you like about it. Um, and um, yeah, check that out. And I'd love to come back on, talk more about this, and talk about talk about that comic, and then talk about whatever else. Yeah, open invite. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, have a good night. Great. Thank you very much. Have a good night, and I'll talk to you soon. See you. Guys, Andy Ellis, candidate for governor, officially candidate for governor of Maryland 2026. Show support. Check out the website. Like I said, it's a great site. Um, get your eyes on it. Uh, read about it. We have to support third parties. I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm telling you who to support, right? Get involved. We, we always come down to, well, I don't know who to vote for. I guess the lesser of two evils. I'm sick of it. I've been sick of it for a long time. Let's focus on third parties. Let's focus on the Green Party. Let's look at candidates outside of the presidency, where you live. Um, if you're involved, they should reflect you in a way. So I tell myself, I can't really use the excuse that that's not my candidate. Why would I support them? Well, once I start supporting them, maybe I can have some influence, especially if they're smaller than these establishment candidates from the Democrats and the Republicans. So anyway, um, uh, great guest, really good. Um, I, I really enjoyed, I see a lot of new people in the chat. That's super cool. Thank you everyone for hanging out. Um, if you're being turned into a moderator, don't panic. We're all mods here. It's just the way it goes. Um, uh, let's see. What else? Yeah, cool. All right. So, yeah, he really... I, I'm starting to think Andy's slogan might be um, the um, public-owned baseball team. <laughs> that, I mean, the chat really reacted to that in a positive way, <laughs> I think. I think if he's on the debate stage and says that, I think the other candidates are going to be like, oh, no. Now we sort of have to agree with that because it's super popular. But whatever you can do to get the vote, I mean, without selling out completely. <laughs> not, maybe not whatever you can do to get the vote, but you know what I mean. Come on. I'm not a politician. I don't speak right. I don't speak good politics. Um, so stick around, though, everyone. Hang out because in a few minutes we're going to be joined by Ken Klippenstein. Um, he, we're talking about one of my favorite topics, and I hope one of your favorite topics, maybe just even increasingly, comic books. That's right. I have actually, and I, I want to talk to Ken about this, I've actually been making a lot of notes about um, government-issued comics, which has been happening for quite a while. You can see I actually have one over my shoulder here, a collection of government-issued comics throughout the decades. Uh, and so Ken has a new article about that, and I want to talk to him about it. It comes up a lot on this show just talking about comics. It rarely comes up that we talk about comics used as propaganda. Um, occasionally, 
I, I will present a comic book to someone. Uh, Kalanji Changa was just on the show, and he said that the comic I recommended to him sounded like a good piece of propaganda, like uh, for a change, a good piece. And um, I was like, yeah, it is propaganda. I wasn't looking at it that way, but it is. I recommended a comic book to him about um, um, fighting evictions in Detroit and winning. And the book is, apparently, it's not out yet. It'll be out April 30th. Apparently, it's as much a tool for how to combat evictions as it is uh, just telling the stories of people who were evicted. So let me see if I can check in on our guest. I know it's been a busy day with the passing of uh, Joe Lieberman. Um, so you never know who's tied up. Hold on. Now I have to apologize for all caps. Every now and then I'll type something on the second keyboard and realize that caps lock was on and that's not appropriate. You guys don't shout in people's DMS. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, while we wait for Ken, what I can do is, well, okay. So first of all, after this show, whether it ends close to 10 o'clock or not, we will be redirected to left past 10, left past 10 starts at 10 PM Eastern tonight. Okay. It's our new group show. Um, free form discussion. Sometimes we have a guest, sometimes we have a topic, sometimes we just show up and hang out. It could be refreshing. It could be a way to um, pull back from the news. But there's always a lot of news. And so we're always, you know, <laughs> interrupted. Our, our, our casual, laid-back, freeform chat is occasionally interrupted by something serious. So let's do this. Let me show you some forms of comics that have been um, presented to us by the government. Here's one I presented to Harvey K. I, I told him about this one, The Life of FDR. This was published by the Office of War Information. Now, what they did was they established that office to tell people, taxpayers, how their money was being spended on the war effort. And one way they they one of the very first things they decided to do is put out this comic, which is, I'll tell you over and over, comics can be one of the most informational ways to um, um, learn. And so they're very educational. And so that's what they did. Now, what did the opposition party do right away complained about taxpayers money being spent but i'll tell you i've looked at this it's free online you can um you can read this for free it's a very well made comic it's hand lettered which is rare that's very rare but it was completely hand lettered it's very well made it's very legible i i thought it was impressive artwork check it out here's another example this from 1952 your vote is vital uh, hold on. There we go. Oh, Pinkerbell says, I got my Death Strikes book in the mail today. Yes. Right on. Oh, cool. I'm glad your oldest kid is enjoying it. That's awesome. I love that book. Um, Your Vote is Vital, 1952. It's a six-page mini-comic book distributed for free by the U.S. government. It tells you how to register to vote, how to, you know, pick a candidate. There's a little quiz in there for voters. It's basically Uncle Sam walking around talking to a whole bunch of white people about voting. You'll notice that in, I have two pages right there, and there's the cover. No people of color, just white people. <laughs> they have one woman right up front. I guess that's good, but come on. So 1952, pretty bland. Anyway, this is a government just trying to be educational and, again, probably spending taxpayer dollars on this sort of thing. But the book I was talking about earlier, which I own, I got this as a gift, is a pretty educational book, um, whether you agree with it or not. It's called Government Issue. Um, let's see here. Let me, let me just make sure that I'm giving you the straight skinny. 
Government Issue, Comics for the People, 1940s to 2000s. Came out in 2011. Since the 1940s, federal and state government agencies have published comics to disseminate public information. Comics legends Will Eisner and Milton Kniff produced comics for the Army. Lil Abner joined the Navy. Walt Kelly's Pogo told parents how much TV their kids should be watching. Bert the Turtle showed them how to survive a nuclear attack. And Dennis the Menace took a poke at poison. <laughs> Smokey the Bear had his own comic, and so did Zippy, the USPS mascot. Dozens of artists and writers, known and unknown, were recruited to create comics about every aspect of American life, from jobs and money to health and safety to sex and drugs. Whether you want the lowdown on psychological warfare or the highlights of working in the sardine industry, the government has a comic for you. Government Issue reproduces an important selection of these official comics in full, uh, in full reading format, plus a broad range of excerpts and covers, all organized chronologically in thematic chapters. I have discovered some of my favorite artists who didn't do very much, but they did some of these government comics. The art is great whether I approve of the comics they did or not. Here are some popular DC comics, um, the New Teen Titans. This was a wildly popular comic book at the time in the 80s, and here they are promoting Ronald Reagan's War on Drugs. <laughs> it's right out there in the open for everyone to see, for everyone to read. I don't particularly like that. I don't want... I, we may have the opportunity to talk to Ken um, but uh, about this, but I, I would rather the government make their own comics rather than dip into my comics. Now, I don't want to go, I don't, I don't want to go pick up a, a copy of my favorite comic and have the government in it the way the CIA has been influencing movies since the 40s, since the CIA, uh, since the inception of the CIA. They've been involved in Hollywood from the get-go. And a lot of people don't even know that, but their influence on Hollywood is is deep and far-reaching. And so I think it's... Yeah, it's... We can talk about the ins and outs of using taxpayer money and whether the comics are even any good, but I'd rather the, you know, Department of Homeland Security make their own comics rather than infiltrate books that exist like the CIA does in movies. Um, it, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a little bit different. You're you're gonna easily convince kids that Superman and Batman are so cool that yeah, of course you shouldn't do drugs and drugs are bad. And then here comes all the um bigotry and racism associated with that and and the stereotypes and it's negative. Uh, check this out. Germ warfare. From 2019, A Very Graphic History by Max Brooks. That's Mel Brooks' son, for what it's worth. Now, check it out. This is free online. I read this at the time. And then, when COVID hit, we were in lockdown, I said, wasn't there a comic about that? There was. So I went back, and I checked it out. It's it's uh, all about... Um, it's, very, it, it's very informative. It tells you all about the history of, um, um, well, here, I'll just read it. Max Brooks has partnered with the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense to produce Germ Warfare, a very graphic history, a highly stylized and engaging, their words, not mine, <laughs> graphic novel depicting previous biological warfare events. Those are just matters of history. Uh, the possibilities for the future this is where they begin to speculate and the continued need for public health security. So there may be a continued need for that, but they do speculate about a fictional future and terrorist weaponizing germs and disease. And I thought that it was very interesting reading this during COVID because this came out in 2019 and it was like a year later, boom. Right. So anyway, the government put out a comic book. Is it bad? Yeah. <laughs> At least it's not Superman talking about the history of germ war. At least it's not the government talking through our heroes, right? Or our favorite stories. 
but check this out. Dark Hammer from 2022, the manga of cyber of of the cyber army of the United States of America by this the Army Cyber Institute at West Point. This comic was made for soldiers and military personnel. Students, soldiers, officers, everybody. Used to educate military personnel. It's a story about a single use or one time use piece of technology that turns the enemy's weapons against them and shuts down their communications with the lesson being cyber bullets are as lethal as normal bullets. Which, (laughs) lame. So cyber bullets are as lethal as regular bullets. And so I read the comic. It wasn't offensive artwork. The story flowed. I don't really understand how it was supposed to educate soldiers, but that's what it was for. So I'm I'm not exactly sure that they, you know, served the purpose that they set out to with uh, serve with that. But comics do make a comics are a great tool. I used to make educational comics. Um, I I used to teach with comics. And then I would teach how to make comics because if you can learn from a comic, then you can teach with a comic. If you can pick up ideas from reading a comic, then you can convey your own ideas through making a comic. So I used to teach how to make comics for that purpose, and I would make educational comics that came along with a teacher's guide. So we would do a two or four page story about the history of Colorado or something. Then we would hire teachers to create um, a, a teacher's guide to go along with it. So now, You give these comics to classroom teachers and then you give them the guide and you say, here's how you turn it into um, an actual lesson plan. And that shit was cool. It was cool. Okay, let's see here. Ken's article ready to come up. I've gotten word that Ken is arriving shortly. Stand by. Good to see everyone again. Thanks for hanging out tonight. We have quite a few people in the chat. Um, all the familiar faces. We got a solid letter hack chat going on here and, and some new some new faces too. So I really appreciate people coming on. I really do. Um, I think that um, my pitch for this channel is perfectly articulated in a little intro video on the homepage. <laughs> but we analyze online media by talking to figures from political online media, independent media, alternatives to the mainstream and alternatives within the alternatives so check it out folks check it out ask everyone to like and subscribe share the stream I hope everyone's following Ken Klippenstein on Twitter and social media, TikTok, Instagram. He's currently writing for The Intercept, and he had an article that was out this week. See if I can put that link in the chat for you. It's not in the description of this video currently, but it will be. Link is in the chat now. Let me see if I can pin it without clicking on it and being redirected. There we go. One of the things I appreciate about journalists like Ken Klippenstein is 
the ability to be hilarious online and to own politicians and public figures while also writing informative articles and doing actual journalism. <laughs> oh, I did not forget to ask about the multi-party proposal. He mentioned it at the beginning. I neglected to follow up in detail, but he did mention it. Thank you, Zero PE, for your four ninety nine super chat, reminding me that I should have done a better job. We covered a lot. He did mention it. It was at the top. We're near the top. But it was not necessarily the the um multi-left party. Okay, joining us now, returning to the show, friend of the show, I guess you could say, Ken Klippenstein. Ken, how's it going? Hey, great to be with you. I apologize for the delay. No problem. You're a busy guy. Um, and I wanted to thank you for joining short notice. I only asked you yesterday. So oh, my pleasure. very much. Yeah. No, I'm more than happy to. Okay, so... This is this is great, right? You've got a new piece out in The Intercept about one of um, this show's favorite subjects, comic books. Your article from this week is about these comics that were published by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, the CISA. They are about misinformation, disinformation, and cybersecurity. One is called Real Fake. The other is called Bug Bites. Everyone should read the article, which I just linked to in the chat. But can you talk a bit about the piece... Uh, that that you've written and i'm interested in what you think overall about whether um this is the government pushing an agenda maybe a waste of taxpayers money which is some of the criticism that you cite in the article or is it harmless overall and and or is it maybe even a good idea um i don't think it's the end of the world but i think that um you know i think it's probably a negative um trend that the government is getting involved in determining what is or isn't disinformation or misinformation. Now, the things that they focus on in the comic books, um, you know, I think are pretty clearly uh, things that people would probably agree are like foreign sponsored disinformation. We're talking about um, uh, foreign, foreign adversaries using botnets and things to push certain narratives about, for example, 5G towers. I had a story on that about a year ago. Um, there's just widespread belief uh, to the point that people are actually attacking these radio towers um, thinking that they're spreading, it's ridiculous to even describe the belief, but um, that somehow these 5G towers are spreading COVID. <laughs> um, and that's actually led to all kinds of cases of vandalism and things um, of these of these facilities. So, you know, these are real problems. I don't want to downplay them. But, you know, in my view, um, a more appropriate way to challenge those things would be, um, you know, uh, non-governmental organizations, um, you know, individuals, reporters, um, but for the government to, you know, get involved in adjudicating what it is or isn't uh, disinformation, that makes me a little uncomfortable. And I don't want to overstate it because if you read the, you know, comics, they, they stick to pretty safe stuff that I think people would agree is, you know, stuff that that's not a good thing, like what I was just describing. So I don't want to suggest that it's 1984 or anything. But, you know, I think that there should be some kind of a debate about what role we want the government to have in this particular problem, which, again, I acknowledge is a problem. There is, you know, because of social media and the Internet. Um, you know, untrue things can spread at a velocity that, you know, there's really no precedent in human history, I think. Um, so that is a problem. But yeah, do they need to be making these? And then the other thing, completely aside from that debate is um, if these comic books are effective. And I try to show in the story that they seem to get very little travel. I mean, I think there was maybe one article written about it in Forbes. And then um, the um, Federation for American Scientists had a thoughtful thing on it too. But other than that, there... <laughs> I mean, it's almost like you see these. Uh, th there were Congress people like Rand. Uh, there was Senator Rand Paul uh, included it in his annual uh, federal waste report, and um, there was one Republican congressman that criticized it. But other than that, there's very little in the way of public engagement with these kind of things. So, so you know, there's the kind of question of what role government should have in adjudicating what's true and what isn't, and then there's a separate question of was this even effective, which I think that the data shows that it wasn't. Yeah, and, and there are things about these comics that avid comic book readers will identify immediately as being less than creative. Um, when a comic <laughs> book 
like just at one point turns into all exposition and it's heavy with dialogue and, and text. It, it sort of loses the point of being a comic. You have to constantly make decisions on what to show and what to tell. And when you just start telling everything, well, you have an agenda, right? So um, another thing they do is, because I, you know, I read both, often people will see, who don't make comics, will see comics as a genre in themselves. And that's wrong. Comics can handle any genre, but they are not a genre. And so it's almost like, oh, we'll do some, some action and then a lot of talking and then we'll wrap it up. And that's really kind of dull. So... There were things I didn't like about it, although I find it hard to criticize anyone's attempt to make a comic. It's just really their their purposes behind it. Do you have any idea what the budget was on this stuff? Unfortunately, that was something I wasn't able to find out, and I asked them about it too, and they they that was one of the questions that they didn't um, respond to. They did say that they discontinued the series. This was supposed to be an ongoing series. Um, they didn't say why. I imagine it has something to do with what I was saying a moment ago, um, how little it traveled. You can paste the link onto Twitter and other social media platforms and see that I think it maybe got like a couple dozen uh, posts linking to the series. So um, not, not much in the way of uh, public engagement, which is supposed to be the point of something like that. Um, but they didn't, they, yeah, they didn't say um, what the, what the amount was to this. Um, uh, I think it was a British, yeah, it was a British publisher. Um, and, you know, in interviews um, with him, I, I mentioned the, the Forbes article, you can read it there. He kind of describes, you know, this is a way to reach younger people. There's some academic studies that suggest that, um, you know, uh, Generation Z and younger are particularly engaged with these type of formats. But as you're saying, there's just a format. <laughs> you can't just throw anything on the page and be like, okay, and then the youngs will come. Like it doesn't, there has to actually be good stuff on there that's engaging, right? You can't just, it's like saying you're going to make some, you know, a public service announcement for, um, I don't know, PlayStation 5 or something. And then it's just a, sc a blank screen. It's like, it's got to actually be fun or people like, <laughs> if people are just going to jump on it just because it's a game, you know? <laughs> Yeah. No. Yeah. And I, I was saying before you jumped on that we had uh, I was involved in making educational comics and you never do it without a teacher's guide so that you can show teachers. Here's how you teach from the comic. Here's your lesson from the comics, not just read the comic. OK, got it. Next lesson. You have to you have to show them the points you made in the comic and how they pertain to real life and how you can, you know, learn from it, not just hope that they will learn from it. Um the reason I ask about the budget is because comics are relatively cheap to make. Uh, and and I wonder, these were just digital, right? Which would make them a lot cheaper even. Interesting. Did they actually? Yeah, I, hmm. I, have no I, I didn't idea. see anything I couldn't find it in the contracting record either. It could be something you could FOIA, but it's just not something I was able to find by the time of publication. Yeah. Well, I guess there's always a chance that if they are using taxpayers, it is taxpayers' money, right? I guess they yes. are just, yep. you know, overpaying themselves. I guess that's a possibility. Yeah, I think that's part of it. Like, I don't want to, <laughs> again, there's a lot of very fraught discourse around uh, disinformation, and I don't want to overstate the case. You know, this is probably a relatively cheap project, but I think what it is, it's an outgrowth of the anxiety people have about these problems, which again are real, but, um, you know, it. <laughs> when people are so afraid of something, then it leads to, do you remember after... Um, you're probably about my age. After 9-11, I remember they were selling things like parachutes that people that work in high rises could yeah. jump out of. And, yeah. it, you know, it's just like it becomes this cottage industry. And I mentioned in the story all of the different sub agencies, not just within the Department of Homeland Security, but within um, the FBI, the Defense Department that are focused on counter disinformation efforts. And so much of that is uh, contracted out that it becomes its own um, industry. And, you know, I think that in, you know, in my view, this is an example of the lack of kind of oversight and, and thought that gets put into these things. Because if someone had glanced at that, like you said, they would realize this is pretty didactic. You know, there's just blocks of text and like, <laughs> you know, it's like the South Park meme. It's like one, you make the thing and two and then three, everyone's engaging with it. It's like, hold on. How would we get to the part where everyone's reading? Because <laughs> right. we've actually got to put some work into it. And that just didn't, it didn't, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I would encourage anyone to read the, comic so they can see that i don't think i'm being unfair when i say it was not a particularly engaging storyline it wasn't um neither one of them were and it's funny the the criticism in the article you mentioned kentucky senator ron paul said dc comics won't be adding these taxpayer funded <laughs> comics to their repertoire anytime soon which is a silly thing to say uh, unless he's also railing against the cia involvement in hollywood since the inception of the cia you know and those kinds of things but I, I wonder if he realizes, can I show you some examples of when the government was in DC Comics? 
Please do. So there's a book called Government Issued. This was award-winning in 2011, Comics for the People, collecting government-issued comics from 1940s to 2000s. You can see they have DC's popular Teen Titans right there, pushing Ronald Reagan's uh, wow. war on drugs, right? So there's a whole history to this. I had no idea. Oh, yeah. yeah. They well, so what? do you know what agency contracted this stuff out? Uh, I don't. It, it may be in the book, um, and, oh, and I can really look, but... It's a great book. I mean, if because, you know, it takes you through the entire history. It's all there. Um, but no, that's a good question. I would love to know like which agencies did that. And and it's probably I mean, it says the first ladies drug awareness campaign, you know. I mean, it's come directly from the White House in some cases. But anyway, um yeah, so that's they hilarious. have been in DC I can't believe comics. That. I yeah, didn't know and, that. I found some examples of um I think there was a graphic novel about a zombie attack that FEMA did <laughs> in like the early 2000s. I was trying to find other examples of these things. There's and this maybe one. one. Germ Warfare. Oh, was it that one? It, that might have been it. This had direction by, I'm not sure how to pronounce this name, Fareed Haig, who was the same, yeah, involved the in guy. writing the other two from the CISA. Right. right. This is by Max Brooks, who's a popular author. Uh, he's done Zombie Apocalypse. He, I think he wrote World War Z, actually. That's so um, funny. No way. Yeah, and so this one's not bad. Uh, it's just, it's more like here's historically how, you know, biochemical weapons and stuff like that throughout history. But then, and look at the date. I mean, 2019, this is right before COVID, right? So they talk about a potential and fictional uh, future, near future, where terrorists are using viruses. And so... It occurred to me that I had seen something like this after in 2020, and I was like, I got to go back and read that. And I was like, wow, this could not have come out in 2020. I think that would have been a little weird. But <laughs> yeah. anyway, then there's this one. Check this out. Dark Hammer, which came out in 2020, 2022. Oh, that's the Army, huh? I'm seeing I'm, and I'm it's, cyber interested. It's but... for their students. It was oh, meant to so educate their students, and it's about this... Um, single use piece of technology where they're like we've got to attack um they're you know it's like there's a standoff right and the army's like what do we do are we going in and they're like actually we're going to use this piece of tech we can only use it one time it shuts down the enemy's communications and turns their weapons against them so it's you know they're still and i i read this comic it's free online i'm not sure how this would educate somebody except to maybe just put the idea out there that we should be focused on cyber weapons. And, and they say that cyber bullets are as lethal as real bullets. That's like their tagline. But anyway, yeah, there's a lot of this going on. It's been going on since, I mean, the I, as far back as I could go was the life of FDR, which came out from the Office of, of War Information. Um, and that was just, again, taxpayer funded to show how um, funds were being spent in the war effort. And of course, um, you know, political opponents were like, those are wasted tax dollars. And I'm like, probably not that much money. That's probably right. a few hundred bucks back then. Like right. now, if I was to print 500 copies of an 80-page comic book and three people worked on it, that's going to cost me about $8,000 total. Wow. And that includes shipping it out to 500 people. So... If it was digital, I'm saving half of that at, at least. Like, you know, in these different government efforts, do you see particularly effective ones? Or yeah, is it mostly I mean, kind of heavy handed? There, I, I think the intention is at times cool, but like it's a wasted effort because for whatever reason. Like, look at this one. Your Vote is Vital from 1952, 16-page <laughs> mini comic book. It was a giveaway. It just shows Uncle Sam talking to a whole bunch of white people about voting. How to pick a candidate, how to register. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. really dated. Huh. Um, there's stuff about health and um, diet, that kind of stuff. But again, if that's for food groups, they're just pushing cattle industry interest you know yeah. what i mean or big dairy yeah. or whatever is it yeah, that's I the thing the devil's cow. in the details like i'm not yeah. against using the format i think it's an effective format um but yeah. it's like how you're doing it you know i think duck and cover is kind of a, you know 
again, yeah. it's like be prepared for the bomb, but you're hiding under your desk. That's the <laughs> cute turtle with the, you know, army helmet, but what good is it? So anyway, yeah. So I think that their criticism is a little weird. Um, I, I think that the books themselves were a little weird, but I do um, applaud you for putting it out there for people to know about. Because I think that you make a good point. It's who decides what we what what information we should be aware of and why, right? Yeah, it's like a very abstract civil liberties question. Again, you know, this is not some you know dramatic assault on our freedoms or anything like that. But I think it raises some interesting questions. Um, you know, who like who gets to decide what is true and false? And the stuff they describe in the comics, like I don't think it was unreasonable, but it's like still, should the government be you know, doing that, I I feel uneasy with it personally. Um, and I feel as though there was no debate. Um, so you mentioned that it was the Cybersecurity and infra Infrastructure um, Security Agency. What do they have to do with disinformation? So I looked into it. It turns out um, they have um, kind of expanded their mandate um, under the argument that there's something called cognitive infrastructure. So your thoughts somehow constitute, um, uh, you know, some form of our infrastructure. It's kind of like... I you know, that seems a little misleading and, and, you know, it seems like it's overstepping their, what they were intended to do. Um, you know, in some other cases they, uh, you know, after, uh, 20, I can't remember what year it was, maybe it was 2017 or so, um, uh, CISA, uh, came to have within its mandate, um, uh, election security. And so that's another way that they kind of, kind of elbow their way into these things. Cause then they can talk about disinformation around election security. And so it's like, with these agencies, as with the government generally, you know, every agency is trying to expand its purview and authority and things. And, you know, that's not even necessarily, um, you know, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, ominous thing. It's just what institutions do. Every institution would like to have more influence. I, as a reporter, would like to have more influence. Um, but, you know, the public should know that. And uh, so that it's not just these agencies doing things that they want to do without any sort of input. And and that was kind of the point of the story. I was just surprised that there was no discussion of it at all. Well, if the intercept ever wants to put out comic strips, let me know either I can help or I always know somebody who can jump in and take care of that for you. Uh, is there anything you got going on that you want to talk about before we wrap up? Thanks again oh, I'm, for coming on. I'm always juggling stuff. I don't even know yeah. what, <laughs> but I appreciate you bringing me on and, and showing me those. Cause this was something I was curious about and I could only find a few examples. I didn't, I had no idea about the whole history of it. Check out that book. It's right here over my shoulder. It was given to me as a gift from my mom back in 2011 when it came out. And I was like, I don't really know about this. But I discovered some of my favorite artists who I did never saw work again after this. But the art was sensational. I mean, I'm sure they did art, just not comics. But there's a lot of cool stuff in there. Just, you know, snapshot of history. There's one. What's the book called again? It's called Government Issue. Um, this. and uh let's see i'll give you the full title um actually i'll bring it up again for you government issue comics for the people 1940s to 2000s by richard graham and he won the will eisner award which is like the academy award in um comics oh i see it now yeah this is great yeah that's a good one um you know there's one in there about being uh, like safety and it's called um, Devil Bike or something like that, where the bike is like satanic, <laughs> this kid's bike, and it's making him do horrible. It's really <laughs> out there. There's some really <laughs> wild stuff Wait, in there. Wait, so what was the public service purpose of that? It was like safety first, I guess, but oh. they're also pushing this like religious agenda or something. That's hysterical. That's yeah. amazing. But um, they say that it reproduces an important selection of these official comics in full reading format, plus a broad range of excerpts and covers, all organized chronologically in thematic chapters. So check it out. I want to I want to see the uh, Reagan drug war one. I got to say, for my money, that's the funniest one. The Teen Titans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty good. And I mean, this kind of stuff comes up in comics. I mean, they deal with real world issues all the time, you know, drug addiction and stuff like that. But literal government propaganda is where I kind of draw the line. So I'm glad that, <laughs> you know, Ron Paul has a point. DC yeah. Comics I try to give him credit where it's due. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, man. Take care. Okay. Take care. See ya. Ken Klippenstein, follow him online.
Read his work in The Intercept. Always a good time. And got to be a friend of the show if he's willing to come on at a moment's notice. So that's it for tonight. Thanks for hanging out, everyone. I, pretty well-rounded show, I think. We got to talk about comics a lot more than usual, even if they're not the best comics. You can check those out if you want. Maybe we'll play a trailer for one or two on Left Past 10. Probably not, but you never know. That starts at 10 p.m. You will be redirected there when we end tonight's show. Otherwise, uh, go do whatever you got to do. Grab something, you know, a beverage or a snack. <laughs> Get tucked in with a blanket in front of your TV, laptop, or iPad, or cellular mobile phone, and get ready for left past 10. Because, you know, if I can guarantee anything, it's going to be a good time. <laughs>